Uh, and uh, I would like to start off by thanking the organizers, of course, uh, for giving me this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to, to be a speaker here and to join the uh, outstanding, stellar uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, to have this privilege of speaking in front of you, because uh, you are also a uh, wonderful audience. And the fact that you were all selected as students here for this school also speaks volume. Uh, you can, this can, can go directly to your CV right? because there was, there was a tough, tough competition to be selected here. So you're, you're all, of course, A plus students. No question about that. And uh, potentially the leaders of, of some fields or subfields. Uh, so it's, um, it's a pleasure to be speaking in front of you as well. And I also think that uh, it was a very nice idea, a very nice vision to uh, put all those disciplines, students working, people working, researchers, students, I mean, in terms of this school, I realize that not all of you are students, but you are students in terms of this, we are teachers, you are students, this is kind of this local terminology for, 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 for those few days. Uh, so um, it's, it's a great idea to, to, to put you all together from different fields from, uh, let me see, mathematics, theoretical physics, mathematical me methods of data analysis. I think also this includes computer science or computer, computer uh, computational physics and neuroscience. Now, the only problem though is that it's extremely difficult to think about how to, to, to speak in front of you and to not to leave anyone behind, right? and to keep everybody on the same page. So let's see, let's see. Uh, in fact, I spent, spent, well, I spent some hard time trying to put, to put this material together. So this gave me some, some uh, tough couple of nights. So let's see, let's see if this should work. I'll start off with a confession. I'm a physicist, so my daytime job is is in physics, and in uh, in, in physics, our subfield is a laser science. So we are building, designing lasers, and then we are applying those lasers to uh, different problems in ultrafast science, broadly speaking, in in quantum physics and quantum technologies. So this is one of our our systems, a typical one, the one that uh, that uh, we we built in the Russian Quantum Center. Now we moved deeper into the into the Skolkovo village. So now it's a part part of the Skoltech uh, campus and the part of the Skoltech uh, building, and it's unique in many ways, and uh, it's, it it shows you. So I I put this picture here to show you that laser physics is many, so some of you are theoretical physicists here. So laser physics is like high energy physics, right? Except uh, in laser physics, we are building our accelerators, our large hadron colliders ourselves, right? So we, we go to the lab and we're building everything, everything, everything from scratch. This is a pain, right? This is a pain, this is blood, sweat and tears, but in return, it all belongs to us, so we can always go back to to back, go back to the lab and spend twenty four hours, seven seven days a week, uh, and it's all ours. Of course, when it works, it's nice. When it doesn't, well, too bad. We will we'll have to we we'll have to repair it ourselves. So. Uh, I can I can uh, spend a lot of time describing how wonderful this system is, obviously, and it truly is. But let me explain you in a nutshell what we are doing right? when we are when we are talking when we are producing ultra short laser pulse. Right? So as I said, as I described our sub area in laser science, this is ultra fast science, ultra fast optics, and to do ultra fast optics, to do ultra fast science. You have to produce ultra short pulses to start with. And lasers, they are famous in producing ultra short pulses. Right? There's no other technology that would be comparable to lasers as far as the generation of ultra short pulses is concerned. Right? So the shortest 
artificial, art the shortest can um, man-made events, man-made event events are produced by lasers, right? So, so no one can compete with, uh, nothing can com compete with lasers, no technology. So what we are doing more or less a universal method, it's very simple. We have a broadband medium which amplifies within a broad range. So we have several uh, oscillations. The fields are oscillations, light is an oscillation. And then we put them all together. And then when all the phases are right, they produce an ultra-short path. Right? And then it generates an ultra-short path. So keep this picture in mind. I will get back to this picture again and again. Right? So this is one of the pictures that they will be integrated. It will help me to keep everyone everyone on the same page, as I said. As I said, thank you. Uh, as I said, uh, it was it was one of the challenges for me to, to try to find some 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 key ideas to keep everyone on the same page and keep going, more or less, not not leaving anyone anyone behind. Right. So this picture. Now, what what are these pulses good for? They're good for making movies, of course. Movies on molecular dynamics. If you have one pulse, one can drive molecular dynamics, and then we have some probe pulses. And then they will read this molecular dynamics out, and then we can play it back as a movie. And then we will see all the decisive episodes, all the decisive moments in the lifetime of the dynamics of molecules. Now, molecules are such species that you can you can know everything about their dynamics if you have femtosecond pulses. Now, if you want to understand how your electron dynamics works. How it looks like inside atomic system, also in, in, in uh, molecules. Then your pulses have to be even shorter. Shorter than ten per seconds means up to seconds. Right? Now, ten per seconds, up to seconds. Why do we need all those pulses in, in neuroscience? So let's see. First of all, ultra short pulses is is already a good start to do imaging to do imaging of biological objects such as cells, generally, not necessarily, not necessarily neurons or astrocytes, or something that we find in the brain. Uh, why? Because with, with an ultra short pulse, you can, you can achieve a high field intensity. So your field can be strong enough to start generating new frequencies. Generation of new frequencies, right? If you if you shine a light of a certain frequency, omega, then it's not very often right, in, in everyday life that you see new frequencies coming out in the medium. Because the intensity of the field is um, low enough. But now a game changer in bioimaging, including neuroimaging, is nonlinear optics. This is where this omega. The frequency, the carry frequency of the, of the ultra short pulse, it's broadband because of ultra short, but still it has its carry frequency. So you generate new frequencies through some nonlinear optical interaction. So the light has to change a little bit the refractive index of the, of the medium, the, the constants, what we believe to be constant. We still talk about optical constants, but they're not constant any longer when we're talking about nonlinear optics. So all those new signals, all those new frequencies are generated and we view those new frequencies as new signals, bringing us new information. Information is not a key word today, right? at least, at least during, during the, time, the, time, the time of my talk. So we, this gives us a way to read out some new information. So how those, those, all those abbreviations here, uh, THG is third harmonic generation, TPF, this is two photon excited fluorescence, SHG, second harmonic generation, coherent light structure and scattering cars. Uh, now, some of those processes are shown here. So this one, H omega plus H omega gives you exactly two, uh, two H omega. Omega plus omega gives two omega. This is second harmonic generation. Now you can think about a process where the, those two, those two, let me see, uh, when, when those two photons excite some real quantum level as opposed to the virtual level show, shown by this dashed line here. 
some real level, then the system spends some time there in the excited, in the excited state, and then it relaxes on a very short time scale. And then it emits a stop shift, a red shift for this is fluorescence. This will be two fold excited fluorescence. And as, as I said, all those non optical processes, they are game changers in, uh, by, by the imagery. Uh, and that will explain why. Now, let us set the scene a little bit. Set the scene a little bit in terms of, in terms of how we are doing neuroimaging. First of all, if we think about mouse brain, because it's not, it's not often that we are doing imaging, imaging on human brain, so it's usually a mouse brain. It's more or less, it's more or less 10 to the 8 to the eight, eight neurons in, in this volume, that big uh, 420 uh, cubic uh, millimeters. And it's more or less half a gram, one gram, that doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't matter. The mean cell density is more or less uh, 1,100 neurons per cubic millimeter, which gives us more or less one neuron per 22 uh, micron voxel. And this already sounds reasonable, right? 22 microns. So you find one neuron per each 22 microns. But then if you start thinking about, about, about synaptic, units then you find once once enough per each cubic micron and it all makes a lot of sense because micron is what our wavelength is a half a micron so we are within the resolution where we're within within the range the right range for the resolution of optical methods spatial resolution this is clear everybody knows that optics is famous for spatial resolution because of the wavelength wavelengths is less, less than a micro. Now, for human brain, it becomes even more interesting, more or less, everybody knows not this, not this number, more, more or less 100 billion neurons uh, in uh, 1.2 K um, cubic centimeters. Now, the human brain consumes, interestingly, 15 watts of power would be enough to eliminate a small small room. And of course, I mean, this is a very rough, rough very rough, very, very rude estimate. It performs, of course, different estimates. Those estimates can 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 vary. They, but the a good estimate that they perform an equivalent of 10 to the 17 floating point computational operations. Equivalent again, this is a very rude estimate. 10 to the 17 floating, floating point computational operations per second. So it's like exaflow computer. What, what, when I'm, well, I know telling computers sometimes in the audience of neuroscience, you have to be careful right? when, when you're saying computer, brain, computer. Well, this is just for the sake of the argument. I'm not going, I'm not going to make a serious argument that the brain is like a computer. Although for some, for some, for some arguments, this is this is this is good enough. At 10 to the 17 floating point computation operations, at least something happens at this rate in the brain. And you can you can think about how all those electrical activity and chemical activity and uh, this enormous speed of information processing. This is what hap what's happening in the brain, more or less exaflow computer. One operation of this this kind per right, 10 to the 17 per second this means one operation per 10 zepta seconds right? 10 zepta second and this is where after second physics come, comes back and remember we are producing alpha short pulses and uh, of course alpha short pulses we are not running alpha short pulses directly what we are using instead the bandwidth. Now, the bandwidth is the key because the bandwidth is the information that your information channel, according to the Shannon uh, uh, Shannon uh, channel capacity theorem, gives you. Right? So let me let me spend some time discussing those numbers. Remember, I have this 10 to the 17 floating point <laughs> computation operation per second, 10 to the 17 flops, floating point operations per second, exaflow level computer. 
right? 10 to the 17 per second. Now, the life of the universe, the age of the universe, again, rough estimate, right? To get excited, to get excited enough. 10 to the 17 seconds. So if you find the magnifying glass that uh, expands one second onto the life of the universe, then the same magnifying glass will uh, magnify your 10 zeptoseconds, the time required for one flow to point operation in the brain, it will make it equivalent to one second. So that kind of that kind of magnification. And we are somewhere here with our lifetime, more or less 10, uh, 10 billion seconds. That's more or less 30 years. So we are probably uh, a little bit more lucky than that these days. Uh, but not three, three ten, uh, if we believe, if we like, like 100 years, it will be three to three ten to ten to the, to, to the left. Doesn't change the order of magnitude. Now, auto second pulses, we can build auto second pulses. Of course, auto second pulses is not something that everyone can have in their lab. Uh, as opposed to that, people have to collaborate. But as, as a result, a lot of people have a lot of fun. And the nice system, a laser system as an, as an, an outcome, and then everyone, everyone can, can use it. Uh, and the bandwidth is enormous, as you can understand. Now, in attoseconds, in, in attosecond physics, in atomic physics, attosecond is more or less usual, usual measure of time, usual unit of time. So what you see here, this dial, it uh, measures the time for an electron, an electron wave packet that spreads out in, in a hydrogen atom on a time scale of 160, uh, 60 up to seconds. And this is the more or less, again, a typical estimate for, for, for a wave packet, uh, for, for a particle with a mass of an electron to spread, uh, to spread if originally it was localized on the typical size of the board orbit. Right. Now, as I said, we are not talking about using this short pulse width. Although sometimes it is needed, of course, not that, not that short, but femtosecond pulses are needed, are needed to achieve this high, high field and density without heating uh, the, uh, uh, the cells too much. What we are using instead this enormous bandwidth. Bandwidth is important because otherwise you are you are losing information. Information. And now this is not an estimate. Right? I was I was arguing in terms of all those really estimates. Now this is already this is already quite quantitative, because we have this uh, we have we have this wonderful theorem, uh, channel capacity theorem by Shannon, and it tells us that this R sub S S comes from Shannon capital S, Claude Shannon, Nobel Prize winner, 1948, his famous work on uh, channel capacity. Never mind that someone called Huckley has, has, uh, has uh, realized that this approximately the same relation takes place several years before. So, uh, so it's Huckley Shannon. Shannon uh, so it tells us that we have this uh, lock base two, one plus s over n. So the argument of this log log function. 1 plus s over n. s over n is the signal to noise. Signal to noise. This is an important, factor, an important ratio. I will get back to this. And then we have delta omega as a factor. So the result is, of course, you are getting bits per second uh, flow rate of information, rate of information. This, you can, you can get the information at this speed, number of bits per second. If you are in the optical range, it's 10 to the 15, right? because the field oscillations, the, the electromagnetic oscillation is more or less for the center of the of the visible range will be two femtoseconds, the cycle, the field cycle. So it will be one over two femtoseconds gives you 0.5, gives you half 
to be 0 0.5, 10 to the 15, 10 petahertz. 10 to the 15, um, 10 to the 15, one over second, 10 to, 10 to the 15, 15 hertz. You have all these enormous bandwidths, even without going to without going to the upper second edge. For one zeta second, of course, it will be 10 to the 18. And then you'll be able to get all those all this information from all the synapses from from every event from any floating point operation event inside the brain, ideal state. But this is an important argument. We will we will keep talking about this. For example, this S over N. Of course, both S and N, they're signal over noise. Both signal and noise, they are both functional frequency because they have finite spectrum. The signal has a finite spectrum because you are not, you are not able to visualize all those signals directly, all those events directly. How do you read up? Well, the standard technology, you, you had this wonderful series, series of lectures here explaining about, you about all those uh, fluorescent sensors, fluorescent sensors, fluorescent sensors. So you excite, uh, and a typical response is shown here. It's pretty slow, right? Well, it shows second. Usually, it's nanoseconds. Usually, it's nanosecond scale. But of course, it kills our bandwidth. Uh, we started with uh, this delta omega is ten, is ten to the fifteen. We're on the petahertz range. But then, if we're a nanosecond, it's already bigger. <laughs> Quite painful. We're losing six orders of magnitude. And so, it so it goes on and on. I will I will be I will be using this formula once in a while uh, as I will be going through my talk. Some laser systems. Now, those laser systems. Th these are our labs at Moscow, Moscow State, University, State University. So these different rooms. This is already pretty much pretty much imaging oriented. So you can see this microscope, microscope here. And we can change the configuration, and it's pretty busy, and it makes it gives us a chance of, to do things um, that are impossible to achieve with standard standard devices. And hopefully, um, I will I will um, I will give you some examples of what's in there. Now, but of course, you can. You can have best lasers in the world, and you can have best people in, in the world working working with lasers. Uh, but you cannot do anything unless you have the best operators, the people who who lead the field in the in neuroscience. And uh, we have this privilege and we have this honor of collaborating through for several years with uh, Konstantin Vladimich and his his group. Uh, uh, I remember Olga Ivashkina was already co-author on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the very first paper, so she also she's uh, also a dear long-term long-term collaborator. Ksenia, part of the she's, she's also here in this audience. And uh, several below, several below, uh, from several places, from the Institute of Biological Chemistry, from the Federal Center of Brain and and uh, neurotechnologist, he, he's, a, he's a director of this new center from, from the Medic, medical university, and he's, he's a wonderful group. They are more or less spending 24 hours, seven, uh, 24 hours and seven days an hour in our, in our lab, and uh, spending a lot of animals there. Right, so uh, whenever I'm discussing any biological experiment, of course, it's uh, nothing would have been possible without, without Without them, without without the wonderful work they are doing, and without their leadership uh, in, in in the field and the, the in ideas uh, sticking broadly. So once again, multiple imaging modalities, all those processes, different processes, they give us different signals, right? different signals, so we can get information in different ways, different channels information in different channels. And all those processes, I have some more detailed um, picture here. For example, this, this one here shows the difference between one photon excited fluorescence, two photon excited fluorescence, and three photon excited fluorescence. And I will be using all, the, all those three processes. They are all important. 
one floating sided fluorescence with one. We have this floating, it's in the ultraviolet, 360 nanometers ultraviolet, whole quadrant ultraviolet. And it excites, and that's typically wavelengths where you have electronic transitions from the ground state to, to, to an electronic state. Yeah, that, that's typical, that's typical. You have to go to the blue or even to the, to, the, to the violet. And it immediately excites the electronic state. And then the system spends some time there, relaxes, and then it emits this green photon. Can be green, can be red, can be yellow. Uh, so it's red shifted and this is your signal this is where you're getting your information from now you can think a little bit and then instead of using this one photon you can use those two photons that will be two photons inside the forest you need two photons now here you're using three photons exciting model is the same transition there are some details by the way so the spectrum of this two photon absorption usually is different and there are some interesting reasons. There are some interest, interesting physical chemistry and chemical physics behind that. Quantum physical chemistry, quantum chemical physics behind that. So uh, there are a lot of open questions. That's, that's an interesting problem. But that now the main question is, why do we take all this pain? Of course, to, to get this one photon, uh, one photon process going is much easier than it is to, to have this two photons or especially the three photon going because they are nonlinear and they, they take you you have to invest much more much more energy you have to deposit much more power but then in return as a payoff you'll get your spatial resolution as you were as you are going nonlinear being nonlinear means being super resolving because you can go beyond the diffraction limit as it is understood in the one fourth regime. A little bit, a little bit, maybe square root of two here, square root of three here, but still you are sub-diffraction. You are sub-diffraction and there's no, there's no, there's no breaking any fundamental laws. This is just multiplication of Gaussians. So in the nonlinear regime, because uh, the dependence on the intensity of the field is quadratic, the resolution here, the lateral resolution, right, the radial resolution will be higher, and also the uh, axial resolution, the longitudinal resolution will be higher as well because of beam section. So your interaction, nonlinear interaction, is tightly confined to this small, small area. So this is how you are becoming super resolving, super resolving in terms of the diffraction diffraction model. So up there. A typical example of a tryptophan molecule showing how you can go from one photon excitation to two photon excitation and then to three photon excitation and then emitting all uh, this uh, the same the same photon more or less the same photon. Uh, now you can as I said you can have also second harmonic generation in two photon excitation uh, the this photon here is not equal to two omega right because the energy conservation works this way. You have those two folds excited, but then you have relaxation here. And then the frequency here is not equal to two omega. But in the second harmonic generation, it's exactly two omega. Second harmonic generation. Omega plus omega gives you two omega. Third harmonic generation is possible as well and very useful. Omega plus omega plus omega gives you three omega. Third harmonic generation. And cars. So this makes things chemically selective because. It allows you to read out the fingerprints of the molecule, which is the Raman, Raman frequency. So you have this uh, four-way mixing process with the Raman, Raman transition, omega-1 minus omega-2, plus one probe field gives you a lot of many degrees of freedom, but a little bit maybe complicated exponential. Right, so... Uh, some pro all those processes are nonlinear, but some are coherent and some processes are incoherent. So this second harmonic generation, coherent are just up as you can see already from the name, and third harmonic generation are coherent processes. So those processes are exactly those processes where nonlinearity meets coherence. 
and this meeting is uh, quite happy because the, all the images, they're produced in a, in a different way. And since they're coherent, we have this summation because uh, all those uh, sine waves, they, they have to be coherent to each other. So they have to share the same phase or at least have a constant phase shift over the entire spectrum to be able to produce images in a slightly different way. So this is already a picture of our one of our papers. I just pulled pull this picture from one of the recent papers uh, showing the difference between third harmonic generation, omega plus omega plus omega gives you three omega in a coherent way versus three fourth excited fluorescence. Well, in fact, three fourth excited fluorescence, believe me, believe, believe it or not, it's a chi five cross, so it's a fifth order uh, nonlinearity, and it's imaginary part of it. And uh, the third harmonic generation is chi three, so they are also different in, in that way. But they are quite dramatically, the difference between them is quite striking if you compare the dependence of the diameter of a particle. So if you make measurements with some well calibrated beads to start with, then, the, then it will be much steeper dependence in the case of such harmonic duration due to the coherence, then you can expect some oscillations here, which sometimes help. Usually they help when you understand them. Because when you understand how those oscillations and those oscillations also shown shown there as a function of z along the along the along the axis. So this is how you can you can have more information and this is how you can you can have a different information. Yes. And then your pulses have to be short and they have to be accurate. And this picture here, this spectrogram, the wavelengths, time, intensity here, right? The math, wavelengths, time, frequency, time, math. We call it frog. Frog. Frequency result optical gating. So we have frog, frequency result optical gating. We have spiders. Spiders. Spiders is spectrum interference direct electric field of the Spider. We have all kind of all kind of uh, all kind of nice nice creatures. We're using them all to characterize out of short pulses, including their phase. The phase is important, right? Because remember, this picture, this picture is important. And it does reflect, it does reflect, you know, you, you remember how those, those sine waves add up coherently, as opposed to coherent addition. Right? So some processes are just nonlinear, other processes are both nonlinear and coherent. And uh, so let's see. And uh, we want to have multiple, we, we, we want to have as many processes as possible. Second harmonic generation, third harmonic generation, two fold inside process, three fold inside process. Multiple modalities. Why? Because the Shannon channel capacity theorem tells me, as one of its, as one of its simple results, that my channel capacity is additive in the number of channels. If I have, for example, two channels, then the information that I can transmit through those channels will be, I will not say twice as high because each of those channels will have its own some value, but it will be the sum of the two individual, on the individual channels. So it, it pays off. It pays off quantitatively in terms of information, information that you can get. So one of the typical lasers, tie set file laser, standard one, chromium first rate laser. This is something that we spent quite some time, already more or less 20 years, more than 20 years that we have been working, perfecting this chromium first rate laser. High first rate laser, this is not something that we find very often commercially. Yet. We can find, them. Uh, of course, the best chromium first rate laser, you know, you know now where to find it. So we've been perfecting those lasers in terms of their, their pulse width, in terms of their peak power, in terms of their repetition rate, just for the problem, for the problem of, of uh, imaging. Because you have to have a uh, right combination of the pulse width, uh, the peak power, and the repetition rate. And it will differ a little bit for two fold and excited fluorescence and three fold and fluorescence. And already here, we have four for the multipliers. So we have, we have three beam lines there to be able to manipulate each beam individually. 
nicely and quickly, right? To do justice to each to each um, beam. And we have four channels, four four detection channels, four detectors, which allows us to realize three four modalities. Four modalities. Now this allows you to image complex objects such as um, let, me, let me show you this more powerful. So what you see here is uh, glial-vascular interface. So this is where uh, you have those astrocytes and their processes and you have those end heats and they're wrapping around blood vessels. So it's a functional unit, blood brain barrier, other, other important, important units there. They, they all relate to this, to this module, to this, to this unit. Now, because we can do this multi, multi model imaging. So we have this red, which is third harmonic generation. Red is third harmonic generation from chronophore straight laser. It's a little bit resonantly, resonantly enhanced. This is why we're using third harmonic generation. It's resonantly enhanced due to the resonance with red blood cells. So this is why, this is why uh, blood vessels stay so bright here. And you, you can see how the, this end, the, the end feed of astrocyte processes, how they, they wrap around, around blood vessels to, to control metabolic processes and uh, to, do, to do whatever they need to do uh, to, do the, uh, to do their job within, within the brain. So the idea is that multiple modalities having multi -mod multiple modalities is just is more than just a fancy 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 uh, option it's it's something that you must have if you want to look at uh, some complex structures and you can do some quantitative of course profiling and, and the resolution is, is pretty nice so you can resolve those so this is where you have this sheath of this layer that the uh, astrocyte process and fit form uh, on the surface of, of the blood vessel. And on key, you can resolve red, red blood cells. But red blood cells are huge, so it's not, it's not a big deal to really, really resolve them. But the entire, the entire uh, picture shows that it is indeed necessary. And it demonstrates another, another modality, another quality of, of, of the imaging which is the cell specificity. And I was already talking about chemical specificity. Cars, Raman resonance, Raman, Raman resonance gives you, gives you a chemical specificity because the Raman position, Raman frequency is a fingerprint of a model, chemical speaking. Now here we are becoming cell specific. Sometimes we, we have to have some little help, of course, from stain. So we, we have to make sure that astrocytes <laughs> Uh, express their own marker and uh, neurons or whatever. Now, red blood cells, this uh, blood vessel imaging is stain free. So, for third harmonic generation, you don't need any stain. And for, for cars, you don't need any stain. For two fourth sided forests, three fourth sided forests, you do need, need some stain. Usually, you, know, you, can, you can have some other forests, but usually to be selective, you, will, you, you, you need some stain. This, this, this has been, has been nice. So we can have chemical specificity, we can, we can have specificity with respect to the, to the uh, type of cells, and we can have also have morphological sensitivity because the second harmonic generation is strictly prohibited, is forbidden from media with the center of symmetry. If you focus your laser light in air, unless it starts ionizing in air, Unless it starts producing plasmas in air, you won't observe any, any second harmonic generation. But on the surface, on interfaces, you, you, you will get a lot, a lot of second harmonic generation. This is why second harmonic generation is so useful to, uh, to visualize interfaces. And that will give you some examples. So, right, so this is a, a picture we are proud of. By the way, this, this movie is published uh, somewhere, maybe Opticlaris. Because so they have some supplementary material, so this this movie, this movie, they can publish that. 
Now, as a further example, further example of those complex, structurally complex, and also dynamical uh, systems that can be imaged due to the uh, multimodality. This is where multimodality is more than just a fancy, fancy, fancy option, fancy idea. Uh, that is not really, that is not really needed. Uh, right, so here we have those model, model uh, cells, uh, HeLa cells, and we have two types of, uh, of stains. Cyper 3, uh, 3S developed by several groups, if I'm sure this group, but uh, by the Institute of Organic, Organic Chemistry in Moscow. And it's a specific, specifically, it's intended to uh, express within the entire volume of cells without the specific, specificity to the cell component. While another stain, which is uh, Phi YFP, red, uh, yellow for a support protein based stain, and it, 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 is, it is linked to fibrillary, which is localized within nucleola. So it's a nucleola um, confined signal. This is what we can observe as those yellow spots, small, smaller spots. There. So you can visualize this little compartment within, within the cell. So now this is a three uh, color imaging, three forming sided fluorescence, second harmonic generation, and third harmonic generation. To get second harmonic generation or third harmonic generation, you don't need any state. Stainless. Now here uh, we are using them to start observing something dynamical, such as cell mitosis, mitosis cell cycle uh, dynamics. Uh, and here we're doing it using a single beam. So in fact, we are we, we're getting all those colors using a single beam, just just one beam, and I will explain you explain you how. In fact, the chrome phosphorite laser gives this magic for us because its wavelength can do everything. It can generate the second harmonic generation, which we can we can comfortably detect. The third harmonic generation, even more important, to have to have the wavelengths that will be comfortably detectable. Because if you start with the dicep file laser here, 800 nanometers, take uh, take the third harmonic will be 266. And you won't be able to get it out of the of the of the of the, of, of the bio tissue to start with, let alone detect it. If with chronophore straight lasers, the uh, fundamental wavelength is 1.25 micron, we can we can get a lot of the third harmonic generation, and it can show you the entire shape, the entire morphology of the object, and then you are you are looking at the same system four minutes later. You see how you can you can even a little bit observe how those centrosomes are for, forming as a part of this of this entire entire uh, formation of uh, microtubule spindle uh, apparatus as a part of cell cell mitosis, mitosis. Again, more dynamics. So what is shown here? So we enjoyed. Uh, this is all more or less. I'm. Uh, qualitative here at this point, but of course you can imagine that this is all your information. In fact, you can quantify this. Information. You can calculate how many bits, bits per second as well. You are getting here to get all those colors. Right? Blue encodes the third harmonic. Red encodes this. So we have two states here. Remember, we have this YFP. And this is red, and we have uh, no YFP is, is yellow. It's localized within nucleoli, and uh, cipher three S. This invention by by Salvos, which is the, it's localized without any specificity to the to the cell cell component. And so we have this three fold excited fluorescence, and it visualizes both the uh, the entire cell and the cell nucleoli, and you can see how. Uh, how the, uh, the the entire process starts, and then here, this image here shows how great second harmonic generation is. Because remember, second harmonic generation is completely prohibited as long as there, there's a center of symmetry. Center of symmetry completely 
kills your second homology, second homology signal off. Now here, what happens as a part of cell mitosis, of course, you have this, uh, this uh, spindle apparatus that consists of fibular, fibular structure. And those fibrils, they're very good because, uh, because very, very good in generating the second homology because they, they, they are just opposed of being, being centrous, centrous symmetric, symmetric structures. And then we have this Y prime, Z prime, Z axis and X prime, Z axis. And we have this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this scans here um, to, see, to see the entire, the entire structure. And to, 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 to really uh, demonstrate that all the information is there. If you want to go to a final resolution, you can. Now, this shows this, that you can, you can have all this information, all these modalities with four channels in the detection, but with a single laser, uh, single laser as a source, a nice chronophosphorite laser, a nice compact box that stands uh, actually in, in every hour left now. Most of the university in Boston, in, 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 uh, in uh, Russian quantum center, we have different different chronic chronic postulates optimized for the for the pulse energy because we don't need amplification, we don't want amplification. Amplification will increase, will reduce the replication rate. We want unamplified pulses, and all those unamplified pulses they are getting they are getting exactly what what I've shown you in the previous previous images. So it's a chrono force laser, 1250 nanometers. This is a central wavelength, this gray, gray peak. There's 1250 nanometers. This is the spectrum of that we're getting from this box, from the chrono force laser. 625 is its second harmonic. This is what we are getting from the cells, from, from the structure of the several cells. It may be sub several structure of your signal. Then, then you have uh, three, four excited fluorescence from Cypher and from uh, YFP, Phi YFP. Those two, green and yellow, and then you can have this uh, harmonic image. So you, you see the sketch. Of course, it's not, it's not on scale. This is just a sketch to show you how it works. And then this gray area, this envelope, shows the absorption spectrum, shows you the transmission spectrum, showing showing that 1250 is also nice because it more or less it falls, it fits with the maximum of the transmission spectrum. Transmission. And our characterization of pulses, this is what usually the freeze want to see. But most importantly is that we need to see to make sure that we are doing our focusing right. And focusing is important. Now we'll get back to this later, because here I'm also explaining that we have this laser here and we can have, we can have all those modalities, but we can also have tunability having some laser here, Tyson fiber, but we are doing this also with chronic phosphate laser. And just this piece of fiber, instead of using another laser, another laser we're using this piece of fiber. And we uh, really did a lot of work on those fibers, modifying the structure of those fibers for more than, more than 20 years. This has been already a review paper uh, 21 years ago uh, when we've been um, producing those fibers for different uh, for different functions as a part of the photonic crystal, we call them photonic crystal fiber platform for nonlinear optical image. Now, single beam, multimodal microscopy, some more examples here, three photon excited fluorescence is used to visualize mitochondria, two photon excited fluorescence is used to visualize alpha, alpha tubulin and two different, two different uh, stains shown here to, 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 to visualize the, the different components. And third harmonic generation that doesn't, doesn't need any, any stain. Now, here we're adding one more stain. So now it's a full color, right? it's a full color. And again, that's a, that's a model, model object here, right here, right side by side. Here we have three, four inside fluorescence, but three, four inside fluorescence, we, we have it from two stains stains and they are, they are, uh, the stains are expressing in um, in different uh, they, they, are, they, they, they are connected to different molecules alpha tubulin and cystine H2P and third generation is the fourth of course channel 
So, wait, what is this one? Because um, so this is our uh, public relations department in the Russian Quantum Center. They found our cars uh, microscopy, spectroscopy, especially appealing for uh, for this movie, and uh, of course we didn't. Jack, uh, telling us, uh, show, uh, showing how, how it, can, it can be used for chemical specificity shown here, right? So you have all those, all those vibrations or even light vibrations, uh, the, the tiny molecular movements that can be detected. And this gives the specificity, the chemical specificity, so we can, we can detect uh, different, different chemical components, components within, uh, within the image. And, uh, applications, of course, they they've done it a little bit their way, but uh, still, still, uh, still fun. Yes. Electronics, electronics as well. Now, let me get back to this. To this. Let me spend some time discussing this signal to noise, because of course, this, uh, all those images, you can get all those images. But they're especially nice when your samples are nicely prepared. Uh, again, once again, when, when you have nice collaborators who are not all, only taking all the pain of preparing a biosample, interesting biosample, meaningful biosample, right? there's some idea behind the biosample, but also the sample that is transparent enough, that gives you a nice S over M, signal to noise. Now inside the brain, you don't have this luxury. Said real brain because we have something that we call sketching. Sketching. Sketching is some fundamental process, and this is again the sketching process is is um, uh, is is a uh, is a process that brings all of us together because sketching is uh, uh, one of the of course classical chapters in the book from theoretical physics. Any theoretical physics will deal with the, with the scheduling problem because it's, it's a canonical, canonical problem in uh, analytical mechanics and classical in quantum mechanics. You, you deal with this problem quantum mechanically and in electrodynamics. Electrodynamics. Now, in brain, we cannot work around the scheduling, right? so we have to do something. So we have this scheduling, uh, scheduling happening happening inside our object and inside our sample, and we have to see, we have to find a way to see, to look through the sketching. So what do we do? What do we do? Now, again, uh, speaking in terms of physics, in terms of fundamental physics, this sketching is interesting because it relates a little bit, especially its quantum version, to tunneling, tunneling or Interaction. So when a particle starts interacting, goes into this scattering, scattering area, and then you have the finite range potential, and then it emerges on the other side. Sometimes in classical physics, you, you, you are not allowed to do this because the potential is high. But in quantum physics, you can do this. And somehow optics is fits both those descriptions because in optics, your light, your optical wave, is both. A particle and a wave. We've known this. We've known this, this since since um, wave particle duality. It's both. And then you can represent your sketching trajectories, those sketching trajectories. You can expand them in those elementary trajectories, very similar to Feynman path integrals in quantum mechanics. And that's very useful because this is how you can you can have a control over this process. A little bit of control will not hurt, and this idea can hurt. And this somehow uh, brings us to this search for lost time in different cultures who have this wonderful book. I had a review paper in uh, Physics of Spehe, which is called In Search of Lost Time. Not see that. 
in such a close time. But then, of course, uh, November. Sometime in each uh, century, uh, more or less, several decades before me, that this was this uh, six volume book. I've never met a person who read them all, all six volumes by Marseille Proust, Proust, which is In Search of Lost Time. In Search of Lost Time. And of course, this character, one of my favorite from Alice in Wonderland, uh, and his clock always show the time, such time that it's always tea time. Now, as I said, this quantum versus classical picture of scattering is, uh, is, is, is very instructive in terms of how we want to control the scattering. So we have different trajectories and all those trajectories. So as light comes in, Imagine, imagine a light wave that you have carefully prepared in your laser mode. Well, you, the laser has done this job for you. It, it has prepared a nicely shaped spatial spatial mode. But then, due to scattering, it generates different pathways, different modes. So instead of one mode, you have multiple modes. So now the question is how you can manage those modes. And here, I put some equations because I talked to some of you and some of you were asking for equations. And uh, my argument was that, uh, I think it was Stephen Hawking who said, who said that each formula in a book reduces the number of readers by 50%. We can, we can think about, we can, we can have the same argument with respect to the audience, right? Whenever we are showing a formula, you are losing part of the, part of the audience. Somebody, somebody certainly is, is always uh, uh, always on another way. But this equation, of course, is fundamental wave equation. It describes how our wave propagates. We have this profile of the fractal physics, and it's complex inside the brain. And we treat this problem as a sketching problem. Now, this is where we are having our book on theoretical physics. Doesn't matter whether it's analytical theoretical, analytical mechanics, classical mechanics, or quantum mechanics. You are always describing the stationary problem of sketching in the same way. You are solving this wave equation, but you are not interested in this t variable. What you are interested in, you are interested in this phi in, phi out, the wave that comes in and the wave that comes out. Remind you your, your laser setting, your optical setting. This is what your laser gives you. And this is what you have to, to, to live with. Uh, this is what your scattered out is about. It's phi out. Now, mathematically, this phi in and phi out, phi in, that's something that the, the incoming field, the incoming wave. So it's a t equal to minus infinity. And this t uh, plus infinity. So this is an outgoing wave. That's a typical stationary problem of scheduling, how the books describe it. Any book, for example. Classical mechanics from quantum mechanics. So once again, supposedly at this point we should all be at the same, the same, at the same page. People, people doing uh, brain research and people working on on fundamental science and on theoretical physics. Now the way to relate this outgoing wave to the incoming wave. So you can all think the scattered light and the laser beam, the input laser beam is through this scattering operator, scattering methods. Extremely important, scattering operator, s -scan. And it has to be unitary to be nice to us. Of course, the real scattering inside the brain, brain is anything but unitary. But to keep the normalization, to keep it always normalized to one, we assume it's, it's unitary. S, S dagger equals S dagger, S equal I, and I is that density operator. You can express it in terms of matrices. Now, Wigner has spent quite some time searching for lost time. So he came up with one of the versions, versions of the answer to this, pro, to this question. How much time does the particle spend under the barrier? Now, if you start thinking about this, the answer will be will, will come out imaginary. It will be imaginary time. But there are some formalisms that instead of so this will be group velocity. The group velocity will be imaginary. 
and this is wonderful. By the way. Now, this Wigner Smith time it's related to the phase time, the phase time, but then you still can somehow find a way to relate it back to the to the wave packet. And he introduced this operator. So all you need to know is this S. So you're not solving this equation. It's not possible to do because this distribution of the refractive index inside the brain, crazy, you cannot do this. Right? So, but you don't have to do this. You just, you are measuring. This is the beauty. You are measuring the scattering matrix. You are measuring the scattering operator. And you are using this completely, uh, the tool from pure theoretical physics, the Wigner Smith time delay in uh, elementary particle reactions. This is where you are using it all the time. The Wigner Smith delay time. So it's minus i imaginary unit s dagger ds over d omega. This is a beautiful result. I like it with all my heart. Now, you can think about this again to adapt this picture a little bit more to the picture of scattering, scattering by brain or by, by some scattering, scattering, scattering sample, and still, still fully compatible with the picture of those uh, multiple channel reactions between the, uh, the element, elementary particles in, uh, in high energy physics. So you have this incoming wave com coming from the laser, and this is your outgoing, and this is all your channels. Here you have just one sine fun function. But then due to all those scattering, because you have all those multiple pathways, so the way the lights makes it to the other side of your sample is via different pathways. And it gives you multiple, multiple delay times, multiple delay times, and you calculate it. If you know all those channels, you can calculate this. Of course, you don't know all those channels, so you have to continue doing some massaging. And after some massaging, you are, you are finding out this logarithmic derivative. And this logarithmic derivative, derivative of course, it comes from this wonderful S dagger S because it's unit, unitary, so S dagger S, S to the minus one, one over S. And it's beautiful, it gives you this logarithmic derivative. What is the logarithmic derivative? This is information. This is entropy. This is entropy. And many people, this is one of the fundamental fundamental problems across disciplines, across sciences. When Claude Shannon came up with his information theory, he was always thinking about thermodynamic underpinning of his uh, information theory. Still open in many, in many because his logarithmic derivative was so reminiscent of the logarithmic derivative in, 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 in Boltzmann view of thermodynamics. Now, people working in thermodynamics have always been searching, still are searching, for the statistical mechanics underpinning of thermodynamics. Now, we are talking about scattering and imaging through scattering. In acoustics, this has been solved very nicely, very elegantly, through time reversal. So in acoustics, the beauty of acoustics is that there are just a few modes. It's not like optics, where the, the, your K vector is all over the place. Very broad spectrum, a lot of modes, very difficult, very difficult to manage them. Now, in acoustics, you can measure them easily and do time reversal. So you can reverse, you can undo the schedule. And it's all about undoing of the schedule. You undo the sketching by time reversal. And again, it relates to the concept of time. And you can see time reversal already here. And it's measurable. You don't have to solve this unsolvable equation here. What you have to do, you just, you just measure, you characterize, you're doing the measurement. You have your slice, slice of scattering medium. You are doing the measurements. You are measuring the scattering matrix, and then scattering matrix by a transposed scattering matrix will be the time reversal operator. And if you are working with the eigenvectors, right now it's operator, so we can have the eigenfunction for each operator. We can think about the problem of eigenvector 
eigenvalue problem. And if we are able to find those eigenvectors by, by doing measurements and acoustics, this is doable. If we can find those eigenvectors, then those eigenvectors, they are telling us each eigenvector of this Wigner Smith time delay operator will, will have its definite delay. So the delay is no longer smear of many modes. It's just one mode with a certain delay time. And by identifying, identifying this delay time is the key, right? As you identify it. This time, uh, you are, you can find the, the eigenvectors and do the imaging with those eigenvectors. This is the way to do the sketch. It's the time reversal and the bigger, bigger, uh, delay time, delay time uh, configuration eigen, eigenvectors. Now we've done a similar exercise in microwave. Microwave is also, you can do measurements a little bit, a little bit easier than, than, than an optics. This works well, and it, Thermogenics, thermo, um, uh, you've heard about optogenetics, right? So this that's already here. We've heard a lot of a lot of uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, lectures about um, uh, optogenetics. But now think about those uh, cell membrane channels that can be activated with micro with um, with heat. Yes. So with microwave, but with some heat. Now, here we use this as an indicator that we are we can do accurately things with regard to the inversion of the of the time and microwave. But in optics, we still have to do some more work, and this brings us to this fish information. Right? So the fish information is that, of course, you want theta. You want to measure some parameter theta. Resolution, the resolution between two points. Or just to check the hypothesis. This theta can be the yes no answer to the question whether there is some object in the world, whether you are, what we are looking at, the image that we are looking at, whether there is some object behind this, a cell or some cell compartment. So theta is a parameter that you want to measure, but you cannot do this. You can measure only X. So you have to live with this probability. You can think about it, conditional probability, f of x and theta, the probability to observe an outcome x given a certain value of theta. Now the score, the gradient of the log likelihood, again, this log likelihood, it's all about log likelihood and their, 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 their derivatives. So you can have the score, and then you can define the Fisher information, the Fisher information as the second order derivative. So the expectation value of the uh, derivative of this log like likelihood square, or you can express it through the second order derivative of this, uh, of this logarithmic. But I also promised some, uh, some illustrations. So what's the point in all those formulas without illustrations? So I found some. Uh, you can think about the Fisher information. Right? The more Fisher information, the higher the Fisher information is, the sharper this curvature here. It's called the support curve. That is very interesting. The support curve. Why support? Because it is intended to either support or not to support your hypothesis. Right? This is in this sense that it is a support curve. So you have this support curve, and if it is a sharp curve, then you have high fissure information, a lot of high fissure information. If it's uh, spread out, then it's less sharpness means lower fissure information. Right? The gradient, of course, corresponds to the maximum of this, of this likelihood. So in a way, the future information tells you how much information on the parameters that you are interested in, you can get by making measurements on X. Whether it's a good idea at all to make measurements on X capital. If X does not depend on set at all, for example, if you're not lucky enough, there will be no information, no way to get to give any information. Now, if the, if the dependence is very strong, then this second order derivative is high and you're getting a lot of information. So you have a chance, you have a chance. Fisher information, important. 
Right. Now, of course, it's all related. It's all related. It's related to the relative entropy that we discussed yesterday. I remember we had this wonderful, wonderful introduction by uh, Alexander Sergeyevich yesterday. Uh, he was talking about entropy of entanglement. My, my comment was that, in fact, it's just it's purely classical. It doesn't have to be entanglement, quantum entanglement, at least. It's relative entropy. This is what Shannon, Shannon introduced to relative entropy. And the Fisher information directly related to this. If you do Taylor series expansion, this is where your Fisher information is. And this is very important, by the way. So it all fits together. It's like multiple pieces of the same at the same time. Now, what is important is that the Fisher information defines the lower bound of your error, of your measurement error. So your mean square error, the error of your measurement, the, var the variance, the variance will be the square of that, will be one of the Fisher information. If you have a lot of Fisher information, you can make your measurements better. There's one example, upper limit. I can derive the upper limit very easily from the Fisher information. Kramer, Kramer uh, Rao bound is the upper limit. I can, I can derive from it. Now, another example, uh, I'll try not to spend too much time here. We can characterize the uh, state vector of a neuron. Right. So imagine a neuron firing at certain, at certain moments of time. And imagine you have no clue why it is firing, how it is firing, and how it transmits information. So you have just no clue about how to describe it. So the best you can do this, you can do as well is at each moment of time, measure whether it fires or not. Of course, you can, you can have much more information, much higher efficient information, if you have an idea of how it encodes information. But if you have no idea whatsoever, now all you can do, this U1, U2, so on, U sub N, is either zero or one, depending on whether uh, the moment of time during a measurement, whether it flies or not at this moment of time. Now, you form this vector. This is what you can measure. Now, you can do the averaging. Of course, you, you have to do this measurement and then you have to do some statistics. Uh, and then based on this, you can define this state vector. The state vector, you can define the psi. And then you can think about two states. Right? So you have neuron firing, uh, neuron firing this way. So you have this trace of ne neural activity. And then you are presenting some stimulus. You're doing something to a neuron, and it responds. Again, you have no clue what this response is, or what this neuron is about, and how it works, how it encodes information. You just measure whether there's, there is some, some response or not. Uh, and then it changes, the pattern changes, so it will be another A. And this is the multi dimensional Hilbert space. Hilbert space is just something that tells me that I can define the norm, the length of each vector. And I can define the angle. And the angle directly connects me, connects me to the Fisher information. Fisher information is completely geometric. Uh, we had this discussion, and uh, uh, it was always that give us some formulas, but also give us some geometric interpretation. The Fisher information just is doing exactly that. This, this is the length of the geodesic curve connecting those two points on this section of this multi-dimensional surface Hilbert space. Uh, and this is the separation, if you like, between two states. Okay. Now you can you can you can do a lot of interesting things with that. I'm not going to discuss them all. One of them, by the way, is to realize that when you are doing your multi-fold measurements, it is not costly. It's not, it's not penalty free. You are disturbing, right? If you're comparing, for example, so there was, there was a beautiful experiment. Let me see. So anyway, so there was a beautiful experiment done by Pyle Maslow's blah, blah, and Vladilian Stepan Shilitoch back then in the 70s, showing that characterizing how much energy you need to make a neuron fire, just a bare neuron without any modification, without any thermogenetic genetic channels, without, without anything. 
Now, it tells us that, of course, you have to be careful much earlier than that, before neuron starts firing. Even if it doesn't fire, you deposit some energy and you inevitably perturb it by just by comparing to typical energies that you find, you find in literature, ATP cost, how, how many ATP molecules you need to make neuron fire. It's a typical class of neurons, just again, very good, good estimate. And you find that with multifortant, multifortant microscopy, you are producing a lot of perturbation. I'm not going here because I want to, I want to kind of uh, uh, see the end of the tunnel here with my scattering and optics story. And I needed the fissure information here because when I'm still continue using my delay times, and my measured sketching metrics, I can combine the fission information. The fission information, remember, this is my estimator. Estimate. It estimates. It's ideal estimate because the fission information tells me how large my error is through the primary level. And one of the fission information will be the very square of the, of the standard deviation. So uh, the larger my fission information is, the better. Now, F sub omega tells me that, in fact, I can, through, by doing this simple calculation, I can get this compact result to get my fission information estimation for the, for the omega, for the frequency. This means that uh, the times, the delay times are enough to make this precise measurement of the omega. So you can argue whether it's useful or not. What I can, what, what I can do instead which I will do instead. Uh, instead of this variable, I will be, uh, so this derivative, I'll be looking at this derivative. I will take the derivative of my measurable delay time with respect to some parameter that interests me and get this piece of information. I do some estimates. Now this delta omega tells me how many, how broad my input light is, my bandwidth. Remember, I started talking about this after certain pulses, beta hertz or um, uh, uh, bandwidth. So this is my this is my available bandwidth. And delta omega is something that my sketching gives me. So it spends some time within within an object, and then it gets scattered after each scattering length, and this is the bandwidth of each individual mode that I'm getting as a result of the sketch. So I have this result, and then I can do this according to the kramer rao bond. I can, I can estimate my variance. And my variance will be one over this f, and the result is pretty interesting. It gives me the almost upper limit, but now this way I'm able to modify the upper limit to include the case of multimodal light, not, not just multimodal light, but the light that becomes multimodal due to, due to the sketch. So this would be um, this uh, lambda, so the um, upper limit, the standard upper limit would be simply lambda over two and a numerical amplitude. In numerical amplitude, in my terms, I had this n bar already in my very first equation where we put it. D over 2L, 3LA. D is the size of my detection, the size of my detection. So the same way of compare, comparing the upper limits, there are, of course, we know this spectral correlation interferometry. You, you, you often can, can come across the claim that they are doing better in terms of the spatial resolution. They are not. Because it's simply the question of a fair comparison with the upper limit. And if you compare with that element, the other element survives, survives simply your numerical aperture in this case, your detector is where you start counting your speckles. The speckles, of course, are inevitable in, 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 uh, in, in, in sketching. So this solves, solves me my sketching problem. Now, this is the best I can do for the sketching. Of course, I have to remember here that this is much longer process it takes much more time to do to do this kind this kind of information retrieval compared to standard imaging the standard imaging 
you have all those ionized theorems relating your spatial distribution of light to the spectrum. And this is how you can do imaging. F, you go to F to 2F to 4F, and you do this imaging. You transfer image all the time. It doesn't work here. Here, and this is where we need people from mathematics, it's ill conditions as ill conditioned can be. If you need an example of ill conditioned problem, this is the scattering problem. This is an ill conditioned problem number one. Right? This is in any book on ill conditioned problem, this will, this will be scattering problem. So it's as ill-conditioned as can be, but uh, I'm going back to our experimental experimental activity. We're doing this, first of all, the multi-mode fiber. The multi-mode fiber, you start with one mode, but then in the, fi in the fiber, it gets expanded in multiple modes. So you have to compensate for that. And then you, you'll have to compensate for the, for the scattering. You're doing all those measurements, you're taking all this pain, and then finally you focus focus into a single point of course through multiple intermediate steps and each of those steps believe believe me is very interesting i can i can spend hours hours talking to you about those about those steps but the result is that you can you can get all those all those multiple multiple foresight and then uh, so you cannot you cannot stop me here because i'm just going to, going to explain the result of this nice work that uh, that uh, uh, we've done in collaboration with, uh, with, the, with the group of the Center of Image. Uh, and uh, uh, Oli Washkin is one of the, of the heroes of this, of this experiment. So he, here we are uh, putting all those fibers together. So it's a multi section fiber and also spliced to green lens uh, to produce an image. And the beauty of this approach is that uh, you can have. So you have, you have section A, the first section of the fiber, and then you have multiple, uh, multiple fibers used as section B, and they all go to different depths inside the brain. So you are, uh, in this case, you are not really precompensating for for the sketching. Of course, you just go right inside the uh, where, where you want inside the brain. But still, there is some working distance. Uh, behind the green lens to see this this image and you have this sketching here within this working working lens now what the work that is now being done here and this is a real picture of the, of the whole stuff. now and then here you can you can have a spatial result it's multiple side probe and you can have some dynamics dynamic because, because you can see some calcium calcium spiking and from calcium spiking of course you can, you can have a lot of information different information as well but those images here, we can have them better, and we will have them better because at the moment, as, as I'm speaking, Matvey is working hard on trying to get the sketching compensation behind the green lens. This is some territory where nobody has been before. Right? So people have, have done some compensation because of the sketching, but no one has done this through the fiber, through the green lens, which is already kind of intended to work in some nice way to have this this working lens plus some dynamic sketch scattering sketching inside inside the brain this is the reference to the work by Boaban Boaban and, uh, and uh, Lidok from Vladimir Alevsky is there is there as well right so it goes on and on but I guess at a certain point I need to stop uh, I had some another example where I'm getting getting uh, useful information out of thermodynamics, out of everything. So this uh, still, so this is a raw image of what we are getting from astrocytes, also through the fiber fiber um, bundles. Now let me, uh, yeah, this is how we are trying. This, this has been going on for three years now. This is a, this is a, this is an experiment. This is this is why some people from uh, Sierra Golosa's group uh, have been spending a lot of time in our lab at Monte Cristo University. So they are they 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 are having those those, those rats, and they are inducing a stroke inside some of those rats. So so it's you have this uh, rat model of stroke, and we are measuring through the fibers whatever we can. Now, what we are measuring here is the indicators of oxidative stress. 
by measuring pH, measuring um, hydrogen peroxide, and uh, making conclusions how different kinds of drugs help or not really uh, as a part of this stroke prevention, stroke treatment, and, and so on. We can measure the temperature and through the temperature that, so temp temperature measurements are interesting because we have also this quantum sensor on the tip of the fiber, so it allows us to, to, to make the, those measurements. Uh, and they are very well characterized against the, the uh, patch clamp of the physiology, so it works nicely. Now, what we've been able to do here, we were able to get the thermodynamic, thermodynamic parameters of a single uh, thermosensitive channel. And so we are talking about this situation here. We have a single channel on a cell membrane uh, neurons in a culture. And they start firing as we increase the temperature. And we've been able to measure the temperature because we have this diamond that measures the temperature diamond with some nitrogen reference. So it's a spin, fully quantum, quantum, quantum sensor, makes the temperatures. And then we have this, um, well, it's not ideal, of course, because we know that there are more than just two states. And then there's another universal curve. Those of you with background in theoretical physics immunity realize that uh, the statistics of fermi fermions are described by this. But of course, this is a partition function. Right? Partition function consisting, consisting of two states will give you this. Right? This gives you, this gives you again. For me, different pieces of science meet nicely together right here as we are getting, getting, getting this curve here to state models either open or closed and then we're getting this response from GCAM so it's optical response and we are uh, recovering all those we are retrieving the information on delta H the enthalpy, ch enthalpy change and entropy change related to this switch and this allows us of course to do interesting things, to model, to design our experiment in such, and then to do this experiment in such a way as to modulate the activity of neurons uh, in an accurate, in accurate way. And that, then this is again, I will, I will, this was my, probably my last slide. Ilya uh, Fedorov, and again, just in the middle of this crisis, crisis, COVID crisis, uh, we had some little, little space to breathe. Uh, Moscow State University was, was somehow closed at that point, so we had to move all the equipment to the Russian Quantum Center, which has always remained, remained open. Uh, and uh, we have we had some heroes, such as Koyler and, and Ilya, who did those measurements and made measurements, uh, temperature measurements inside, inside, inside a mouse using this uh, spin on a fiber approach. So this is my last slide, I'm, I'm tweeting, tweeting here, laser neuroimaging. So let me try to be thoughtful here. Unique spatial resolution, no question about this. We knew about this, we knew that optics has this unique spatial resolution. Now, I try to emphasize, this is not really a novelty, but I try to emphasize for you that the bandwidth is enormous, unprecedented bandwidth which translates immediately, of course, translates into unprecedented information from basic recovery basis and unprecedented time resolution. So if you, if you at some point you, you decide to, to or detect um, ECG or something like this and try to resolve this, and this is of course some thought experiment at the moment, but in principle, the time resolution is there. The bandwidth is going there. Now, scattering is a problem, but it can be managed. At least there, there are some ideas. There are some, not just ideas, they, they do work in some model environment. Of course, it's much more difficult to do this in the real brain. But scattering is a problem, but not, not, not a showstopper. Let me put it this way. Now, we can go vastly multimodal. Vastly multimodal methods of imaging, methods of light delivery. Right? Imaging is a lot of different nonlinear optical processes. Methods of light delivery through cranial window by focusing, focusing will be through a microscope or using a fiber. And methods of neural modulation, optogenetics versus thermogenetics. Now, it's ideal 
and the cellular at subcellular level. Right? Again, no question. So this relates to the spatial resolution, but we don't know what we're going to do with those 100 billion cells. Right? This is a question, and this this is more than just just a number. This is fundamental. This is fundamental. Uh, connects in many ways, and this is nice, this is pleasing. Uh, connects, so I tried to make this connection clear to you as, 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 as the best I could. So it connects, as far as I'm concerned, I convinced myself, I don't know whether, whether I talked myself into, into ending up thinking that it does connect, it makes this connection in many ways to computational mathematics and theoretical physics. And we need this mix. We need this mix, right? We know mathematics, pure mathematics fails, right? We have, uh, mathematics is, is incomplete, but computational mathematics is exactly what we need, right? Because we don't need to, 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 to know pi until the, the, the end of digit, which is not the last digit, which is not there anyway. We just need this computational mathematics because optics is the best, right? It can give you 10 to the 17 delta omega to omega precision. And yet it is incomplete. Right? Even optics cannot tell you what, what the pi number is because pi is both a number and a function. Could be a game changer. Okay, but it's not been there yet. Thank you. Questions, please. Please. <laughs> We were asked to speak, uh, not to use this uh, microphone, but to speak to the microphone and the camera. Okay, uh, thank you for the lecture. So my question is, of course, uh, about the last point of the slide. So what uh, laser neuroimaging still miss uh, and what it need to become a game changer? Right, uh, optics alone, I mean, to be brutally honest to you, uh, optics alone cannot solve all the problems because, I mean, of course, there were some heroic efforts in putting all the microscopes in the world, the best microscope in the world, side by side and back to work back and make them doing doing imaging, and still they 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 cannot make the imaging of the entire the entire brain. So it should go together with computational mathematics. It should be hypothesis driven. Maybe this is the right answer. Maybe, maybe instead of, I have to be compact with my answer. I think it has to be more hypothesis driven. So optics has to be driven by hypothesis. The hypothesis should be there. We need those computational mathematics. Maybe theoretical physics, I don't know. It would be nice. But computational mathematics, definitely. So we need those models. Uh, and we need to have. We need to check the hypothesis. So, if we, so we need to look at two different um, two different parts inside the brain, and we should be uh, checking some hypothesis. All the tools are there. The tools are there practically in terms of microscopes, in terms of concepts and ideas. All those statistical measures, future information, and whatever entropy, the, the information measures are there. Everything is a quantitative uh, quantitative measures are there. But hypothesis on it. Can I uh, continue the question? If uh, hypotheses are the missing uh, piece uh, of uh, a game changer uh, role of laser physics, and it depends on computational mathematics and theoretical physics. So we have three components. Uh, is there any role for neuroscientists in, in this? And if yes, then what? Well, computational models, com computational mathematical models are not possible without the information. This is, they, they have to be grounded to information from neuroscience. It starts with neuroscience and it ends there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, my question, uh, the next question is, uh, is it possible to formulate uh, what would be the single most uh, important idea for me as neuroscientists, not a theoretical physicists, uh, from uh, today's lecture uh, 
as a take home message to change my work and to understand uh, brain better in this synthesis. Probably the key idea which goes through uh, theoretical physics and computational mathematics and information. Uh, whatever you would like to, if it is possible at all, to say is a key message from the lecture for neuroscientists. I would say the importance of information, not just as uh, some abstract concept on some very high level of abstraction, but something as a very practical tool that is already there and it's it's there for you to do all the all the you it can return just give me give me the distribution statistical distribution and I will mm -hmm. give you the number in terms of bits. This depends of course on the on the system of units. And bits per second or nuts per second and depends on the base of the logarithm. Uh, bits for base two logarithm, mm -hmm. nuts yeah. for, for natural logarithm. So information is there not just a level of a high level of abstraction, but as a very practical, very powerful tool is there. Optics already immediately connects in many ways to information, but the take home message is, 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 still, is still, still not this one. Uh, because uh, I, mean, I have something in your question that makes me think this way. When Shannon published his work and that his recognition for his work. At a certain certain point, he published an editorial. I don't remember where, but I remember that it was. It is there that he used this bandwagon. Yes, I remember. Yeah, we, we everybody know, jumping we, we, into we the bandwagon. We know that bandwagon is something. Now these days, we bandwagon is almost like like swearing. Mm -hmm. like telling somebody that you are jumping into somebody's bandwagon means that. You don't have your ideas of your own, that you're jumping on somebody's back the back, so you cannot lead your lead your own way. It was yeah. 10 years later, I think at uh, 58 or something. Yeah. So what he was telling was that information, right, information, he was he was the pioneer of this field, and he was saying that people are searching, searching for all the answers in information theory. They are, they are, they are, there's some he didn't use this word overhype, mm -hmm. but more or less. They are trying to jump into that, that bandwagon. Instead, they have to go back to the lab and work hard. But this is my rendition. So we'll have to, we will all have to do this up to up to this this wonderful week. This is a take home message. No question for the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. Uh, my question is, well, dealing with MEG, I think I can wrestled with you regarding the ill posedness of the problem of your science no, no, well, problem. I, well, I, yeah. I heard your, I heard your yeah. question. So, so the, but the question is, um, when thinking about how to resolve the image universe problem, maybe create, reduce its ill posedness, I'm thinking of maybe some active ways to change the brain, you know, some magnetic electromagnetic properties of the brain and to measure the same thing once again to get more measurements of the same phenomenon. So, well, given that optics can do anything, right? Can you somehow think of some methods, or maybe they're already being used, or maybe already thinking of them, that you can somehow change the optical properties of your sample that would that would affect this, you know, that would give you another measurements and change the scatter slightly, you know, and, and, and bring you more information. But doing changing something to the brain, I mean, the the best expert in doing this is just behind you. Not to the brain, not to the, but to, to the physical, to, to the optical properties of the uh, optical properties. This is exactly what 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 Kostatin Ladinsh was doing. I mean, transparent brain. And ah, this, yes. This 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 can you do it? Can it you do dies. it? But, but it's slow. But it's slow. <laughs> no, right? it's slow. It dies. <laughs> <After> <laughs> but can you do it fast? You know, like for instance, here, on the same, like on the scale which is faster than the processes that you are looking at, right? Yes, so that can. you can get yeah, more yeah, measurements. Yes, we can. Both in terms of. Um, yes. At least, at least, I can think. I can. I can fantasize. I can. I can. I can. I can think of some ways how to how to do this, both by using a laser. But it will not again. It will not be penalty free. So I have to think about the consequences. And even again, as, as I try to make, make make it clear, even before it it boils, even before you fry fry the fry the, the cells, 
you are changing the information. Well, that's the, it's yeah. fragile. It's yeah. fragile, and it's 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 not just. So you have to be careful. But other, uh, if we, in principle, we can, of course, we have nonlinear optics where you are modifying the properties, and now we know how to change the magnetic property. And, and to yes, measure my light, light, light and uh, this two interaction. Yes. I, I had some slides toward the end of my talk, which I which I checked as suppressed because it was uh, too many. But we can measure the magnetic field. Yeah. We can measure the magnetic field. not not at the level of a single neuron magnetic field at the moment, but uh, at least not at the level of single neuron in human brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the magnetic field measurements from a single neuron of um, James Quid, probably something like that. Mm -hmm. Some 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 big big uh, big uh, uh, work. They did some this measurement at Harvard. Mm -hmm. yeah. the science paper. So, but this is a measurement, but you can modify as well. You can you can, you can well there are ways. Yes. I can I can envision. Yeah, basically the idea is just to, to write more equations. You know, like you have you have, so, you have yeah, few measurement of sites, you have a lot of a lot of unknowns, and well by Changing something very rapidly without You're getting more with unaff unaffecting mm -hmm. the substance of what you're measuring, mm -hmm. you could have gotten more equations and then the opposeness you know, yeah. gradually. Well, it will never go away completely. And you're right that, but we can we can we can maybe somehow be ahead, you know, of this change and then, and, and yeah. get more information before it changes the object. People in the, with theoretical physics background would call it the method of Lagrangian multipliers. Because this is what the method of our web and the multipliers business, just to figure out I know what you thought about it. Yeah, about this one. Uh, how to how to yeah. how to identify additional constraints to get more equations. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much once again. Thank you.